Know that there once was a Darth Treya, and that she cast aside that role, was exiled, and found a new purpose. But there must always be a Darth Treya, one that holds the knowledge of betrayal, who has been betrayed in their heart, and will betray in turn. Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day today. Today we're going to cover Darth Treya. She's quite an interesting character from Legends, so here we go. Is a lightsaber still a lightsaber if it lost its power? Is a Jedi still a Jedi if she lost her Force powers? These are many of the types of vexing questions were staples for the students who studied under the Jedi Master, known simply as Kreia. While her apprentices were mystified and intrigued by her challenging conundrums, her fellow Jedi viewed them as quaint, but they were far from it. Kreia, as a Jedi historian and master, was in search of deeper truths and encouraged her students to challenge and question their assumptions. Not to rely on what they saw in front of them, but instead what was concealed beneath it. In fact, her own eyesight remained unused and she relied purely on the Force to penetrate the mysteries of the galaxy. Because of her eccentric method of teaching, the Jedi Council were concerned and kept a careful eye on her, but her Jedi trainees admired her philosophy, especially one Padawan who was particularly gifted, known only as Revan. He would leave her tutelage, but only because he wanted to round out his education by learning about the Force from the perspective of the other masters in the Order. Eventually, he would return to her for guidance when he found himself at odds with the Jedi Council concerning their inaction against the Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders, who were waging a war on the Republic across the galaxy. Revan would decide to defy the Council and to go to war with the Mandalorians. Many other Jedi joined him in his crusade. In fact, all the Jedi that had been Kreia's students went with him to defend the Republic. The brutal war would lead to Revan and many of his followers turning to the dark side. Those who did not turn simply abandoned their training. Now as a consequence, the Jedi considered all of Kreia's pupils to be failures and denounced her and her teachings. Thus, she was exiled from the Order. After her expulsion from the Jedi Order, Kreia wanted to know more about what had led to Revan's fall. So, she traced the path he had taken during the war and ultimately felt herself being drawn to the Sith world of Malachor V. Now this planet was a nexus for the dark side and had once been a part of the ancient Sith Empire. So once she arrived, she found the Treyas Academy, an age old dark side praxium that had served as Darth Revan's stronghold. When she entered, she was confronted by Sith assassins left behind by Revan. But surprisingly enough, instead of attacking the old Jedi, they instead showed her manuscripts and tomes containing the most closely guarded and profound secrets of the Sith. The texts could only be read through the Force, and they revealed, as Kreia saw it, the cosmic truths she had strived to comprehend her entire life. Truths that changed and perhaps broke her very sanity. The ancient Sith sorcerers who had authored the texts claimed that they had obtained insight into secret realities beyond ours. The contradictory and aimless nature of existence, as understood by most sentient species, was a burden to comprehend and an obvious lie. Anyone who was force sensitive. Now the force, by its very being, revealed there was much more to reality than the apparent, and therefore every force sensitive lived in a constant state of betrayal, and they were forced to live in a compromised and chaotic universe. They had to live a lie and realize it. At first, Kreia tried to argue against these revelations, denouncing them as falsehoods, but she came to perceive that her resistance was a self-defense mechanism. She believed every word of the texts, and she knew it. She saw now that Revan had never fallen to the dark side, but that he had met the call for greater actions to be done. With that, the Jedi Master Kreia was no longer. In her place stood Darth Treya, the Lord of Betrayal. She re-established the Treyas Academy so she could create and train an entirely new generation of Sith that would continue what Darth Revan had started. Revealing herself as Revan's former master to what remained of the Dark Lord's forces after their defeat in the Jedi Civil War, the Sith troopers pledged to follow her. Having secured a military force, Darth Treya felt within the dark side, certain force wounds that called for her. Following where they led, she eventually encountered two powerful Sith Lords, Darth Sion, the Lord of Pain, and Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger. Both Darksiders were interested in rebuilding the Sith Order and agreed to joining her in forming the Sith Triumvirate, an alliance made up of several if not hundreds of Sith apprentices, Sith Masters, and of course, Sith assassins. However, even as Sion and Nihilus had agreed to apprentice themselves to her, 
their ideals and visions for the Sith did not match Treyas. She wanted to fulfill Revan's vision. While Nihilus wanted to satiate his hunger and Sion was becoming more obsessive with his crusade against the Jedi. After she had taught Darth Nihilus how to use the dark side to devour entire worlds, the two Siths began to plot against her. So, in the innermost sanctum of the Academy, known as the Treyas Core, they confronted her and stripped her of her connection with the Force. But instead of killing her, they decided it would be crueler to let her live exiled once more. After casting her aside, Darth Nihilus took her place as the Dark Lord of the Sith, and both he and Sion began their Jedi assassination campaign. It was so effective that most of the Jedi were wiped out and those few who weren't went into hiding. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Essentially, they left no Jedi alive in the galaxy, at least from what they knew. While the two Sith were busy with their Jedi purge, their former master had assumed her name of Kreia and left Malachor V, searching for another Jedi exile named Mitra Surik. Now, Mitra Surik was one of her former Jedi students and had served as a general under Revan when he was still a Jedi. This was all during the Mandalorian Wars. Now, she had been instrumental in defeating the Mandalorians during the final battle of the war, which had taken place at Malachor V, by ordering the activation of the Mass Shadow Generator. Now, this was a devastating super weapon that had crushed both the Republic and Mandalorian forces caught in its destructive wave and left a substantial wound in the Force. The horror of what she had done was so great that it threatened to kill her. So unconsciously, the Jedi General had severed her own connection to the Force, which might have been the only thing that prevented her from falling to the dark side, as had happened to every other Jedi under Revan's command. Kreia wanted to find Mitra because of the Jedi General's unique, innate talent in Force bonding, an ability a Jedi has to form connections through the Force. The stronger the Jedi, the stronger the connection. Kreia intended to help Mitra reconnect with the Force, as the former Dark Lord had discovered a way to deafen the entire galaxy to it, and believed that through Mitra she could create a Force wound greater than any other, a wound that would spread throughout the galaxy and never end, silencing the Force forever. Kreia found the exiled Jedi General unconscious from a drug on a Republic warship. She took the Jedi aboard Revan's former ship, the Ebon Hawk, and barely escaped an ambush by Darth Sion. During this ordeal, both Kreia and Mitra subconsciously reached out to each other, forming a Force bond that intertwined their lives. Though they had reached the mining facility, Paragus too, in relative safety, it didn't take long for Sion to catch up to them in the commandeered Republic ship, Harbinger. This was where Kreia came face to face with the former student, since she hadn't seen since he exiled her. They fought, but Kreia was easily defeated, losing her left hand to Sion's crimson lightsaber. This simultaneously caused Mitra to feel Kreia's pain in her own hand because of their bond. You can see the inspiration here possibly from the whole Rey and Kylo connection. After they had escaped Sion once more, Kreia took the opportunity to convince the Jedi exile that because of their bond, if one of them should die, they both would. This left Mitra no choice but to keep Kreia close to her. As Kreia slowly guided Mitra into reconnecting with the Force, she began to teach the younger woman that the actions of a Jedi should be chosen carefully, and that Mitra should always consider the ethical implications of all quests she undertakes. What is right and moral is not as simple as dividing everything into the light and dark side of the Force. The morale of the inhabitants of the galaxy were more complex than that. What the right thing to do was not always so straightforward. They decided to try and locate the various Jedi Masters that had gone into hiding, in order to see if they could get their aid in stopping the Sith. As Mitra's connection to the Force grew, more and more companions were drawn to her through the Force. Kreia realized it was the younger woman's Force bond ability, transmitting a call of sorts that caused these strangers to bond with her. Through many adventures, they eventually met with the reassembled Jedi Council in the ruins of the Jedi Enclave on Dantooine. But instead of deciding to help Mitra, the Jedi Masters believed that she was a wound in the Force herself, and a danger that could lure the Sith to them. So, they attempted to strip the Force from her, for real this time. However, Kreia stormed in, and having herself reconnected to the Force through their long journey, used it to drain the Jedi Masters' connection instead, thereby killing them in the process. She 
then assumed her Sith persona again and was once more Darth Treya. The Sith left Mitra, who was unconscious and shortly afterwards returned to Malachor V. There she planned to sacrifice herself as her death would open up a large wound that would destroy the Force itself. But before doing so, she decided to wait for Mitra to come for answers and a final confrontation. After confronting and defeating Darth Nihilus, Mitra did indeed follow Treya to Malachor V, though before she could reach her former mentor and ally, the Jedi first had to deal with Darth Sion, who waited for her within the Treyas Academy. Now, I've made a video on Darth Sion. Uh, he's a pretty cool character. He was pretty much almost immortal, so stay tuned for that one. The problem with confronting Darth Sion was that the Sith Lord was technically already dead. His body was decomposed and a scarred mess. Essentially, he was an undead zombie with a keen mind and a tremendous dark side ability that just grew and grew. It was only the Sith's iron will that kept him alive, much like Darth Maul, but Mitra was able to erode that iron will through their duel, eventually convincing him to give up the pain that was keeping him from dying. As he let go, he told the Jedi General that she had been his weakness, but she was Treya's weakness too. Finding Treya in the Academy's core, Mitra first tried to reason with her former teacher, but to no avail. With no choice, they both clashed in an epic lightsaber duel, but Mitra was in time able to cut off Treya's last remaining hand. The Sith then demanded that Mitra kill her, but the Jedi refused. Angered by her unwillingness, Treya used the Force to control three lightsabers and attack the Jedi with them. But once again, Mitra was able to best Treya, though not without landing a fatal wound on her. Despite being the Lord of Betrayal, Mitra forgave Treya for her deceptions and everything that had happened. She still wanted to try and save her old teacher, but Treya stopped her and told the younger Jedi that she already had. It's kind of like a Luke and Vader moment. And that by killing her, the Jedi had awarded her more than she could possibly possibly know. Treya then admitted that she truly loved Mitra, not just because she considered her her greatest student, but because she didn't believe that she was a true Jedi. Treya then drew upon the force that radiated from Malachor V, and as a last gift to her student, she looked into the future of the galaxy and that of Mitra's friends, telling the Jedi what she saw. Then, she expressed her hope that Mitra would follow Revan into the unknown regions. However, whether she chose to do that or to simply depart the planet and return to her life in the Republic, or even if she was to decide to stay on Malachor V and wait for the other Force sensitives to join her in time, there was no dishonor in any of her two choices. She could even return to her exile, where her Force bond would have no effect on the lives of others. But Mitra chose to follow Revan, and with that, Darth Treya surrendered her life to the Living Force, the mystical energy she had tried to destroy, but now embraced. Now one with the Force, her body was soon enough destroyed when the Mass Shadow Generator was once again activated, resulting in the annihilation of Malachor V. I hope you all enjoyed today's video about Darth Treya and some backstory on Revan and Sion and Nihilus and the Legends characters that we've all grown to love. If you want me to cover some more Legends characters, let me know who you would like for me to cover and explain. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you also have an awesome rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, remember, the Force will be with you, always.